All right, hopefully that's looking pretty good on your end. Um, so today I am presenting on amphibians and reptiles of the Midwest. Um, so like Jeff said, I'm one of the newer field coordinators um, here in central Iowa. But before I was a field coordinator for Trees Forever, I was a graduate student at Missouri State University, and I did my graduate work on box turtles. Um, so I know a whole lot about amphibians and reptiles, especially in this region. Uh, Missouri was a little bit more diverse with the Ozarks, but we have some great um, local uh, reptiles and amphibians that really love our grasslands. Um, and I'd like to talk about that today. So when we are thinking about reptiles and amphibians, um, we refer to these two groups together as herpetofauna. Um, people that study reptiles and amphibians are called herpetologists. Um, but in actuality, reptiles and amphibians, they're not all that similar. So here we have our family tree of reptiles. And reptiles all come from this amniote ancestor. So that means that they um, came from this ancestor that laid a specific kind of egg um, that was protected by a hard shell. Obviously that trait was lost um, or at least uh, changed in this mammal lineage. But for reptiles, they all have these special sorts of eggs from this ancestor. You can see here that amphibians are not on this family tree because they don't have that protective coating around their eggs. They're more jelly-like um, and they can desiccate or dry out really easily. With our reptiles, we have these different categories. Squamates um, are lizards and uh, snakes. Um, we also have tuataras. They do not occur in North America. They only occur in New Zealand. We have turtles, which are our shelled friends. Um, they're kind of a unique branch of reptiles. We have crocodilians, uh, which include alligators and crocodiles, and these do not occur in the Midwest. And then we have all of these extinct lines of dinosaurs. Oops, sorry, my cat kept on, stepped on the keyboard. Um, and then we have birds. So birds are technically reptiles. Um, they descended from this amniote ancestor, and they're very closely related to what were dinosaurs. When we think about frogs, they did not descend from this amniotic ancestor. Um, they have those jelly-like eggs, like I said. And we have really three main categories of amphibians. We have frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians. So frogs and salamanders you may be familiar with. They're pretty common here in the Midwest. Sicilians, they only occur in tropical areas. The closest you'll get to seeing them is Central America from here. Um, but what reptiles and amphibians have in common is that they are cold-blooded, so they can't thermoregulate um, with their metabolism. They have to thermoregulate or control their temperature with their environment. So that's why you see snakes basking. Um, it's because they can't control that internally. They control it by moving where they are in the environment. So during this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about the um, kind of the risk certain organisms have of extinction. And that is following this category set up by the, by the IUCN. And um, when we have data about organisms and their historic populations, we can kind of see and predict how close they are to extinction. Um, so there are organisms that are endangered. Um, there are organisms that are vulnerable. Um, and there are organisms that are not really of uh, conservation concern yet. So they would be under uh, species of least concern. So most organisms have a classification on this scheme, um, except for organisms that we don't have enough information about yet. Um, so they're not, they haven't been studied enough. 
So one reason that we should really be paying attention to reptiles and amphibians is because a lot of them are threatened or near threatened. Um, and that's because of all of these kind of man-made changes that are going on on our planet. So this could be because of climate change. It could be because of habitat destruction. With frogs and toads, one of the biggest um, things that is impacting their populations is a particular fungal disease um, that has been spreading um, due to invasive species and other factors that can really just wipe out an entire population of amphibians very quickly. You can see here that we also have this big section of frogs and toads that we just don't have enough information about yet um, to really determine if they are at risk of extinction or not. With reptiles, they're kind of on the same path of becoming more and more threatened um, as urbanization increases on our planet and things are changing. Um, it's not quite as intense yet as it is with amphibians. And that's just because amphibians are much more susceptible to disease. Um, they have a very thin dermal layer. Their skin is very, very thin, um, which makes it so pollutants and disease is, um, it, it, it enters their body much more readily. So with this presentation, my goal is to kind of highlight some of these really interesting um, species that live in Iowa and Illinois and the Midwest and um, show you the biodiversity that we have and highlight some of these organisms that maybe are at risk of extinction if we don't change something. So I'm going to start with snakes and I made this table that shows all the snakes that are in Iowa and Illinois. And this is my most cramped table of the day uh, because we have a lot of snakes. So you can see that there are a lot of snakes that overlap between Iowa and Illinois. Those are listed in green. We have a lot of snakes that occur only in Illinois. And that's just because there's different habitat there for these um, snakes to inhabit. And then we have a couple of snakes that are specific to Iowa um, that really like our prairies, our tall grass prairies. So the first uh, category of snake I want to talk about is the rat snake. Um, so there's a couple different species of rat snakes um, between Iowa and Illinois. We have fox snakes, black rat snakes, gray rat snakes, and the Great Plains rat snake in Illinois. Um, this, I wanted to highlight the species, the black rat snake specifically for all you farmers or even chicken owners um, out there, because this is most of the time, if there's a snake in your coop um, eating eggs, it's going to be the black rat snake. Um, they love sneaking into chicken coops and eating eggs. Sometimes people will lift up a chicken and find this giant black rat snake underneath. The good news is that rat snakes are incre incredibly docile. Um, they don't typically strike at people. They can be kind of intimidating because they are quite a large category of snake. Um, this is also a common snake that you might find in your attic. And that's just because they are so good at climbing. So you can see this picture of a black rat snake climbing almost vertically up a tree. Um, I've seen these snakes climbing brick walls um, so they can climb almost vertically up um, and kind of sneak into areas they're not supposed to be. These snakes feed primarily on rodents, though they are opportunistic and might go after other snakes or lizards. Um, and they are constrictors, so they constrict their prey typically before they eat it. And so right here on the bottom left, we have the Great Plains rat snake. This is only found in Illinois, not Iowa, but it is state endangered. In Iowa, we have a very similar looking snake called a fox snake, which is also a rat snake. Um, and those are probably one of the most common snakes that you'll find here in Iowa. 
Um, another category of snake we have is water snakes. And this is um, especially around ponds, streams, the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. And these snakes, um, as you can predict from their name, love water. So they spend a lot of their time in or around water and their prey is mostly fish and amphibians. Um, one of the cool things about these snakes is they have an anticoagulant in their saliva, um, which kind of starts breaking up your blood um, before it's even, you know, digesting. And so unfortunately, if you get bit by one of those snakes, uh, a water snake, it tends to look a little bit gruesome just because um, your, your blood's thinning a little bit and so you bleed a little bit more. Um, so I've picked up one of these snakes before and got bitten and it looks like a crime scene, um, but they're really awesome snakes. Um, another cool thing about these snakes is they give live birth. Um, so the eggs develop and hatch within the snake and then they give birth to litters of little baby snakes. So there's a lot of different water snakes that occur in Illinois and Iowa. Um, the most common in Iowa is the copper belly water snake. Um, that is a species of conservation concern. Um, we also have the Midland water snake and the diamondback water snake. Um, so especially fishermen and people that love boating, they're excellent swimmers. They'll, you know, follow your boat sometimes um, looking for their prey, but they're really awesome snakes. The next category of snake is our vipers. Um, so the family of Vipiridae um, includes both rattlesnakes and moccasins. And we have both of these categories of snakes in Iowa and Illinois. And these snakes are incredibly misunderstood. Uh, people are very intimidated by the fact that they are venomous. And that is obviously something you don't want to mess with. Um, but there's also um, a, a measure of respect and uh, you know, dignity that you should give these snakes because they have a job ecologically. Um, and they were here before us. And they're not after you. Um, they're actually really awesome snakes. So the most obvious thing that um, these snakes have that make them different than the previous snakes we talked about is they have hinged fangs with venom. Um, the water moccasins like copperheads and cottonmouths, uh, their venom is a little bit less dangerous for uh, if they bite someone. Um, it, doesn't usually cause fatality, but rattlesnake venom is incredibly dangerous and causes many fatalities. Um, these snakes also give live birth similar to water snakes. And one really awesome thing about um, this category of snake is that they are awesome parents. They're awesome moms. So rattlesnakes, um, they take care of their young in what is referred to as a rookery. And all the female snakes get together and they have their babies kind of in rocky outcrops or caves and then um, guard those babies all together. Um, similarly, in cottonmouths, the baby snakes will trail their mom for several weeks after um, they leave their nest and they have a measure of protection from that. So let's talk about the venomous snakes in Iowa and Illinois. So the prairie rattlesnake um, just occurs in Iowa, not Illinois, and it's only found in one um, reserve in Northwest Iowa. So this is a more rare snake. Um, it obviously has that rattle as a warning um, and it you, you won't come across it unless you're in this very specific region of Iowa. The timber rattlesnake is much more common and it's actually our largest snake in Iowa and Illinois. Um, it's found mostly along the Mississippi River and you can tell it apart from other snakes because it has this distinctive um, black tail. And they are protected in a lot of counties in Iowa where you're not allowed to kill them unless they're within a certain um, 
yardage of your home. And in Illinois, they are listed as threatened. Um, the thing about rattlesnakes to keep in mind is they're not after you. Um, there is this history, especially in the southern United States, of um, rattlesnake hunts where people try to kind of um, cull the populations, but that is incredibly unnecessary. And a lot of these snakes are of conservation concern now, and we're really trying to preserve these natural species that we have. Other venomous snakes, we have the copperhead. Um, in Iowa, this is considered an endangered snake. And they're only found in the very southeast corner of Iowa in a couple select counties. In Illinois, they're found uh, more frequently in the southern third of the state. And they're most active between April and October. They're um, a snake similar to most of these vipers that kind of um, go into hibernacula, so these special cave um, or rocky outcrops to overwinter. And then we have the Massasauga. We have Eastern and Western Massasauga in Iowa and just Eastern in Illinois. And they're endangered in both of the states. So venomous snakes, really awesome. Always treat them with respect. Um, we also have the cottonmouth just in Illinois, not in Iowa. And one of the ways that you can identify a cottonmouth right off the bat is they will open their mouth wide and they have this bright white mouth, obviously cottonmouth. Um, and uh, they occur mostly around water, but they do not occur in Iowa. I hear people mixing them up with water snakes all the time, um, but you'll never see one in Iowa. So if you hear a rattle, what do you do? Um, if you're out and you happen to hear a rattle and you see a snake, um, I would actually try to um, avoid that area in general. Um, most people, when they get bitten by a snake, it's because they step on it or they accidentally grab it. So just make sure you're aware of your surroundings. Another thing to keep in mind is just because you hear a rattle or what you think is a rattle doesn't necessarily mean it's a rattlesnake. So most commonly, um, if somebody calls me up and they say that they found a rattlesnake and it's in a shoebox in their garage and I go look at it, um, it's a regular non-venomous snake um, that just happened to shake its tail and hit the sides of the box. So non-venomous snakes also shake their tails just like a rattlesnake. And if they happen to be in leaf litter or near something that that tail bumps against, then it sounds like a rattle. So you don't need to be terrified out of your mind, um, but also be just aware of your surroundings. Um, these venomous snakes are not particularly fast and they're not out to get you. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that these snakes can strike up to one third of their body length. So never get within reach of that. Um, if you see one across the field, you don't need to worry about it, like running at you and attacking you. Um, they just want to be left alone. If you're wondering if a snake is a water snake or one of these venomous snakes, there's a couple of things that are telltale signs. So if the snake has a triangular shaped head, that indicates it's venomous. If it's more rounded, that is likely a water snake. Water snakes also have rounded pupils, while um, venomous snakes have these vertical um, pupils. Um, the unfortunate thing is both water snakes and um, copperheads and cottonmouths have keeled scales. So they kind of have a point to their scale um, rather than a rounded scale. So sometimes it's hard to tell, but if you're not 100% sure, you know, if it's a water snake or a, a copperhead, just keep your distance. Um, this is a picture of a copperhead snake hanging out with its babies, kind of giving them a measure of protection. 
And one thing I'd like to point out about these baby snakes is you can see that the very tip of their tail is this yellow color. And they actually use those, um, their, their tails to lure in amphibians. So they'll be sitting on rocks and then wiggle their tails if they see a toad and the toad thinks it's a worm and they'll jump a little bit closer and then the snake can get them. So I thought that was just a really unique adaptation that these snakes have. Next, we're going to go into lizards and there are much fewer lizards in this region than there are snakes. Um, so you can see that um, in Iowa, we have a couple of these prairie specific species that are only found in um, Iowa, not Illinois. Um, and then there are several species found in Illinois, not Iowa, and then we have some overlap. But the most prevalent group we have um, is a group of lizards called skinks. So skinks are characterized by their small legs um, and they have kind of a fat cylindrical long body. Um, one thing that's interesting about these snakes, not snakes, skinks, is that they can shed their tails if something comes up and bites them. So that's called having an autonomous tail where you can shed your tail and it does grow back. So you can see that this Great Plains skink, um, which is Iowa, uh, endangered in the state of Iowa, this one on the bottom has kind of these two branch out tails. And that's just because this tail regrew a little bit funky. Um, one of the most common skinks you will find is the five line skink. And when they're juveniles, they have this bright blue tail that's just beautiful. Um, and the reason they have that bright blue tail is because they want to attract predators if they see the skink to grab onto that tail and not go for the head. Because losing your tail isn't a big deal, but losing your head is. Gina, so just to yeah. clarify, that that forked tail for that Great Plains skink, that's not common. That's only because it was damaged in some way and then a, a new tail tried to grow back? Yes, exactly. So, um, it, it got damaged in some way, and then the tail was regenerating and regenerated a little bit funky. That is amazing, thank you. <laughs> yep, um, so they have this awesome regeneration, um, you know, adaptation. And that is actually something that human scientists look at when we think about salamanders and lizards, um, because it's awesome that they can do that and being able to know how that works scientifically um, can further science and medicine and humans. Um, one other species of lizard that I wanted to stick in here is the slender glass lizard. And that's just because this type of lizard is insane. So you might think off the bat that this is a snake because it doesn't have any arms or legs, but it is actually a lizard. Um, and you can tell it's a lizard because it has eyelids and snakes do not. And then also, if you were able to see this a little closer up, it also has a little hole for its ears, which snakes also don't have. Um, they're called glass lizards because they shed their tails very, very easily, like um, our skinks do. And so people, you know, grab them and they kind of just break off like glass. Um, these organisms don't move as well as snakes do without legs. Um, their scale placement is a little bit um, more rigid, so they don't move with, move with as much ease, um, but they are excellent burrowers and um, they're common across the Midwest. And then in Illinois, we have two species of lizards that were introduced that are found in Southern Illinois. So one is the Mediterranean house gecko, and these guys have sticky little toe pads so they can climb up walls, and they are closely associated with human homes and buildings. So most of the time when I see these guys, they're on the side of a campground bathroom that's heated. Um, they'll also hide in crevices in people's homes and eat the bugs. Uh, they're not 
a huge concern right now. They're not invasive or causing any major problems, but they are there. And then we have the collared lizard. And these are only found in Johnson County in Illinois. They are beautiful lizards. Um, they're primarily found in Arizona and Oklahoma. The males have this beautiful um, blue coloration. The females are more brown in color. And they were introduced by humans in the 1990s. And for the life of me, I could not find any article that explained the story about how these lizards got introduced to this area. Um, I'm sure there's an interesting story there about what happened, um, but they're just hanging out in Johnson County, Illinois. So maybe you'll see one if you're in that area. Our next category is frogs. Um, and we have a lot of frogs in the Midwest and they range from be being very, very tiny, like the size of a quarter, to being huge like a bullfrog where you have to lift them up with two hands. And we have a lot of species that are very unique to this region as well that are um, adapted to our prairies. One awesome thing about frogs is you don't necessarily have to see one to know it's there. Um, they call, they vocalize, and their calls are specific to their species. So this is a calendar, um, I believe this is of Wisconsin, of when the frogs start to call and it is very much temperature dependent. And frogs will call to attract mates. Um, so oftentimes female frogs do not vocalize um, they do have like a very subtle vocalization that they do um, to respond to males sometimes when they're very close, but oftentimes they, they don't have that complex call that males do. Um, one of the first frogs that you're going to start hearing in the spring is the spring peeper. Um, it has a very, very high trill. Um, but one thing I encourage people to do if you're interested in frogs and toads is to learn the calls and um, kind of recognize what might be in your own backyard that you're hearing. So within our category of frogs, we have toads. And people always ask me what the difference is between frogs and toads. And it's just that toads are more adapted for living on land. They have more terrestrial adaptations like thicker skin. Um, they don't lose water as readily. Um, they don't have to be right next to that water source. Um, they also have these large glands, these large, um, they look like big bumps behind their eyes and those contain bufotoxins. Um, which are these special toxins that they can release if they are, um, you know, grabbed by a predator. So in Iowa, we have three species of toads, of true toads um, within this particular family. In Illinois, there's only two. So bottom right, that is an American toad. And you can tell it's an American toad because it has spots on its chest. On the left, you have the Fowler's toad, um, which has more of a bare chest. And then on the top, you have the Great Plains toad. Um, and this one occurs in Iowa, not Illinois. And it has these elaborate markings on its back that are sometimes a little bit green. Um, the most common toad that you will find um, in Iowa and Illinois is the American toad. One of the biggest issues with identifying toads is the fact that they hybridize. So American toads and Fowler's toads will have babies that look a little bit like each of them. Um, so that can be a little bit difficult sometimes, but most of the time you're finding American toads. So I am going to stop sharing my screen for a second. And I would like to introduce you guys to an American toad. So this is a male American toad. And you can see that his throat is black right now and that's because he feels threatened. 
Um, he does have some spotting on his tummy and this darker region um, near his pelvis that's called a pelvic patch. And that's an area of thinner skin where he can absorb water more readily. You know, please move um, they, just a little bit to your left, just a little bit to your okay. left. There we go. Yep, looks okay. good. Um, these warts on his back, they are not contagious to humans. Um, you know, those just are for um, his own protection. And male toads, um, they have these little bumps on their hands. You probably can't see it because of the camera, but they have these little bumps on their hands that allow them to grab onto female toads and hang on a little bit better during mating. But he is a very good toad. Most of the time when you pick up toads, they tend to pee on you. But my toad is so used to being picked up that he no longer pees on me. So I will get back to the presentation. All right. So our next category of frogs are our true frogs, and they're in um, the family Lithobates. And these are very large bodied frogs that are really only found around water sources. Um, so most of the time when I say frog, this is what people think of. The very long hind legs, very good at jumping, very good at swimming. Um, in Iowa, we have bullfrogs and green frogs in Illinois too. Um, and there are these big bright green frogs um, and the way that you tell them apart is actually um, their skin folds on their bodies. So bullfrogs just have a skin fold around their tympanum or their ears. And on green frogs, they have that skin fold plus an extra one that goes from their eye to their ear. Um, we also in this region have both leopard frogs and pickerel frogs. And um, pickerel frogs have more square uniform spots than leopard frogs. And all of these frogs, um, one awesome thing about them is even though they look alike, they have completely different calls. So um, bullfrogs, they um, sound like a lightsaber, um, their call does. And green frogs calls sound like a banjo. Um, so you can tell what's in your pond based on what you're hearing. Bullfrogs are invasive in many areas of the world um, and in some ponds here um, in the Midwest um, because people farm them for their frog legs. Um, one thing I would like to make you aware of, um, especially if you do any um, activities in a classroom with frogs, is um, some people go out to get tadpoles to raise indoors and they get these tiny little tadpoles and they think that the tadpoles will mature in a season. Um, but a lot of these tadpoles for these larger body frogs, they take two years to mature. Um, so unless you're ready for that commitment to raise a bullfrog tadpole for two years, I discourage um, you from doing that. Um, so one of the other interesting true frogs we have in our region is the crawfish frog, which is um, this amazingly beautiful frog in the bottom right. And it has these large distinctive spots. Uh, but this is a very diverse group of frogs and we have many, many species in Iowa and Illinois. Um, the last group of frogs I'll talk about is the tree frog. Um, so in Iowa and Illinois, we have both gray tree frogs and Cope's gray tree frogs and they are almost indistinguishable. Um, so a lot of the time you don't know the difference unless you take some of their DNA and sequence it. So the top right is a gray tree frog. Cope's tree frog will look almost exactly the same and they occur in mostly the same range too. Um, there is a lot of variation in gray tree frog color and pattern. So even though this picture is, you know, gray and mottled, sometimes they do like a little bit more green. Um, 
the green tree frog at the bottom right that occurs in southern Illinois only, um, not Iowa or in northern Illinois. And the way you can tell the difference between these tree frogs is because it has this very distinctive line of white that looks almost like a very long mustache. And these tree frogs are most active at nighttime. So most of the time, um, if you see them during the day, they're kind of tucked into a little tree trunk or something um, rather than out in the open. So we will move on to our salamanders and newts. Um, Illinois has way more diversity of salamanders and newts than Iowa does. Um, and that's just because um, there's more waterways that are available for them, more suitable habitat. Um, when we think about salamanders and newts, um, one of the species we have in common is the eastern newt, which is threatened in Iowa. And these newts are highly toxic, um, especially depending on where they're found. Um, so if they have a lot of predators in a certain area, they will actually evolve to boost their toxicity up. So they have a very unique life history where the adults are aquatic, um, the eggs are laid in the water, they have gilled larvae, but they have this terrestrial, this land-dwelling teenage phase, the red act. Um, so these are really awesome when you find one. People are always looking for them because they're so cool. Um, and they have these bright red spots. Um, but that's why it's important for this species to be in water that's near forests because they have this intermediate stage that goes onto the land. And they'll stay on the land depending on how um, long uh, the, the, it's suitable for them. So they'll uh, go back in the water when conditions change. One of our unique species is the mud puppy, and these are fully aquatic and they have these external fluffy gills, and they are threatened in both Iowa and Illinois, and they are what is considered a neonetic species. So they never go through that metamorphosis that that eastern um, newt went through. They stay in this space forever. Um, so one similar species that is also neonetic is the axolotl, um, which is native in Mexico. And um, they retain their gills and stay in that larval stage forever um, and reproduce in that stage as well. Um, so they're kind of babies forever. Um, the reason that they're called mud puppies is because um, I've never heard it, but allegedly they can produce a very subtle barking vocalization. Um, next, we have our mole salamanders, which include several different species. And this um, is similar, and it has a larva with external gills that are lost in adulthood. Um, so all of these salamanders pictured their larva would have those fluffy gills and be aquatic. They have a large body with coastal grooves, and you can see those really well in that top picture of the spotted salamander. Um, and these lizards, not lizards, uh, salamanders can be really difficult um, to ID and define uh, species-wide because they hybridize, they have babies with other species and create an intermediate. And there are also all female populations of some salamanders. And that sounds crazy, and I'm not going to get into the details of it, but basically the female salamander will take the sperm of a male and that um, stimulates the production of an embryo. But somewhere in that process, all the male DNA gets thrown out the window and it just uses the female DNA. Um, and that can create some funky situations that scientists don't really know how to define very well. Um, so on the bottom right, that is an Eastern tiger salamander. And I have another little critter to show you guys really quick. So I do not have an Eastern tiger salamander. 
um, but I do have one of its very close relatives that is found in Texas and um, southern states, and it is the barred tiger salamander. So this is the barred tiger salamander. Um, this guy has a very, very long tail. It's almost as long as his body. And that is because it is a male salamander and they have much longer tails. You can see he has those bright yellow markings. And so a lot of salamanders, um, they migrate to vernal pools, which are non-permanent um, bodies of water. And the reason that they do that is because they do not want to be in bodies of water that have populations of fish that could eat their young. So they go into these, um, usually they're found in forests, but they're these pools of water that um, dry out and they can have their babies there um, for the season. Um, another awesome salamander that we have in Iowa and Illinois is the blue spotted salamander. It is endangered in Iowa. There are these very small populations, these pocket populations in Iowa, uh, but they are awesome little salamanders um, and very beautiful with this very rare coloration. Next, I'll move into turtles. Um, one of my favorite categories of organisms. And um, we have a good diversity of turtles, especially um, with the Mississippi River running between our states. Um, and I'll highlight some um, species of turtles that are especially awesome. So snapping turtles, there are two species of snapping turtles um, that we can find in Iowa and Illinois. Common snapping turtles, like their name implies, they are much more common and widespread. Um, they can be found in rivers and lakes and streams. Um, alligator snapping turtles are much more uncommon. Um, they're endangered in Illinois, and I know there are reports of maybe some sightings in Iowa, but I'm a little bit hesitant to say that they are established in Iowa at this point. Um, someone can correct me though if that is wrong. Um, alligator snapping turtles, they have these um, kind of spike-like protrusions on their shell and they have a very defined beak. Well, common snapping turtles, their shell is more smooth um, and their beak is less defined. Alligator snapping turtles, I've worked with them in the past in Oklahoma they're actually incredibly docile. Um, you obviously don't want to get your fingers too close to their mouth, but they are not a very aggressive turtle. Um, common snapping turtles, on the other hand, I am terrified of them because they look at you like they want to eat you. Um, but these are both turtles that can get incredibly big um, and are just awesome staples of Iowa turtles. Um, we also have box turtles, which are terrestrial turtles, and they're unique in that their shell isn't completely rigid like most turtles. They have a little hinge where they can bring up a section of their shell and box them into their shell completely. Um, the ornate box turtle is found in both Iowa and Illinois. That's on the right with the um, bright yellow coloration. And they are found in sand prairies, which is a um, ecosystem that is not very common anymore in Iowa or Illinois. And it has the sandy soil and um, tall grasses. And it also has prickly pear cactus. Um, and because of the um, habitat destruction, these turtles are not very common anymore. They're threatened in both states. Um, the eastern box turtle is found in just the southern counties of Illinois. Um, they can also have bright colored shells. They're kind of difficult to tell apart. Um, but if you look at the plastron or the bottom part of the shell, 
um, on ornate box turtles, it will have black markings, but on Eastern box turtles, it will be plain. Um, one cool thing about box turtles is male box turtles, they will have red eyes like you see on the bottom left, um, and they'll often be more colorful, um, while females usually have brown eyes. Um, and one other awesome species of turtle that a lot of people don't know about, um, we have two species of soft shell turtles in Illinois and Iowa. The smooth soft shell turtle is endangered in Illinois, um, but they have this flexible shell that's kind of leathery, and this makes them excellent swimmers. They go super fast and they can hide in little crevices that other turtles can't. Females get much, much larger than males. They're actually one of the largest freshwater turtles we have in the Midwest, um, while males stay pretty tiny. And they have special um, membranes that allow them to absorb oxygen and water. They have that in both their mouth and throat and also on their rear end. Um, so that's just one thing that makes these turtles extra special. And you can tell the difference between spiny and soft shell turtles based on their nostril shape and also the edge of their um, shell when it comes to their neck. Um, the spiny soft shell turtles have these little protrusions um, like fleshy spines while smooth soft shell turtles don't have that. So I told you about all of these amphibians and reptiles in the state. Um, how can you engage with them? So if you want to go out and see reptiles and amphibians, one of the easiest ways is to walk trails. So um, one thing that snakes especially really like is the warmth of pavement on their belly, especially during dawn and dusk. So just by walking around, sometimes you'll spot these guys on the road. Some people go road cruising um, in their cars and go down country roads at dawn and dusk trying to find snakes and other organisms crossing. Um, we refer to uh, the study of amphibians and reptiles as herpetology. And when people go out looking for amphibians and reptiles, people call that herping. So if you hear someone is going out herping, that means that they're looking for amphibians and reptiles. Um, Illinois in LaRue Pine Hills has this worldwide famous herping spot called Snake Road, and it is closed every year during migration season for all the snakes to cross the road. Um, touching or harassing the snakes is not allowed, but you can go and take pictures and people from around the world will go to this one spot in Illinois to take pictures of snakes crossing this road. And there is just this mass migration of organisms and it's super awesome. Another way that people find amphibians and reptiles is just by putting boards out in the grass. So they're attracted to warmth, um, corrugated metal also works, but people will put down these boards, let them sit for a while and snakes and frogs and other salamanders and um, herps will hide under the board and then you just flip it over and see what's there. And that's honestly how a lot of scientists collect their data. Um, if you're trying to sample how many snakes uh, species live in a prairie, you put all these boards around and you flip them over um, every other day and you see what you find. Um, one cool thing in Iowa is that we have the Frog and Toad Wildlife Survey. Um, so you can sign up for a workshop to get trained in how to recognize frog calls. And then they collect this data from citizen scientists and they um, record it. And they have all of this data since 1994. Um, and there's other uh, citizen science initiatives like this. Um, I believe the AZA um, also has a similar program that's nationwide where people can um, identify frog and toads to uh, contribute to science. Gina, so this is a yes. great time to ask this question uh, from Mary who says, is there a good reference for frog calls? 
Yes. Yeah, so if you want to learn them officially, um, you can go to one of the workshops that the DNR has. Um, there's also great recordings that you can find online. Um, and I was planning on distributing some of that with a post webinar um, update email wise. So I'll make sure to include that. Thank you. Um, one thing that I do want to end on is that a lot of people have reptiles and amphibians as pets, including myself. Um, you know, the toad and the salamander I just showed you. But if you are planning on getting a reptile or amphibian as a pet, you want to do your research. Um, so you want to get the right size enclosure. Um, you want to know what to feed them and you want to know how long they live because a lot of these organisms are super long lived, like 15, 20 years. Um, another thing is you should think about where the animal came from. So you should not go out and just pick up any animal you find and bring it home and put it in an enclosure. You want organisms that come captive bred. So that means that um, they were raised in captivity. They don't have any chance of having parasites or any sicknesses that they could have gotten from the wilds. Um, and you also just generally don't want to take something out of the wild that's doing a job um, that's, you know, already inhabiting a space that um, depends on it. And another thing is if you do have a reptile or amphibian or any animal for that matter, you do not want to dump it um, if it becomes too much work or you can't handle it anymore. A lot of people get these little tiny turtles from ponds and they think they're gonna stay really tiny forever. And then you end up having an eight inch red ear slider um, in your living room that you can't really take care of. And you can find animal sanctuaries or um, wildlife refuges that can take these organisms from you, but you never want to introduce them into a new area where they might disrupt um, the ecosystem or the other organisms that live there. Um, so with that, I will take any questions that people have. We have all sorts of great questions here. Awesome. So let me just, let me jump right into it. So okay. one of the first ones that came up, and I think this was when you were talking about the two lizards that maybe are in Illinois and you have no idea how they got there. John asks, are the introduced lizards escapees from human, uh, human captives, maybe pet owners? Yes, so I would suspect with the Eastern uh, collared lizard that that would be an escape pet because some people have those as pets. Um, the Mediterranean house gecko has been an exotic species in the South for a very long time. And I think what might have happened there is it just crept up um, because of climate change or campers that maybe bring them unintentionally in their clothes. I know some people have Mediterranean house geckos as pets, but I would suspect it was more of um, an accidental introduction that way. Fantastic. Thank you, Gina. So another question from Patty here. Uh, she says, I think we have spring peepers in a low area near our house. They're very noisy, loud, when yes. they are singing. And when I walk to the wet area, they stop making the noise. And Patty wants to know why. She'd like to see them. It sounds like there's yes. thousands of them singing when they start making the spring noise. And she mm -hmm. wants to know how she can see them. So frogs um, and calling in general, there is a cost benefit analysis that these frogs are doing subconsciously when they call. So calling has the benefit of attracting females, but it also has the cost of maybe attracting predators. So the minute that there's a disruption, they will usually stop until they think that disruption is gone. So typically what I do if I want to hear a frog or see it up close and try to find where it's at is I will just park myself somewhere and wait and they will decide that I am, am an inanimate object and then they'll start up again. Um, but when you move, they think you're a predator and they don't want you to come up and grab them. So the one thing you have to have, but that nobody wants is patience. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> 
So next question up, uh, Scott wants to know, where in Iowa do we see soft shell turtles? And he's thinking geographically. Um, man, I don't know off the top of my head. I, so I, for the last two years, I was in Missouri and I would see them constantly in lakes and um, streams and they were just everywhere. Um, I have not seen one in Iowa yet, um, but they do have the capability to be living almost in any body of water. Um, geographically, I'm not sure. I believe they're both statewide, but I am not confident on where county-wise you would be able to find them. Thank you, Gina. Here's a really interesting question. Uh, thank you, Candace. She says, when was the last crawfish frog seen in Iowa? Uh, Candace does a frog and toad survey for the DNR in Van Buren County, which mm -hmm. is one of the last known counties for this species. Okay, um, so crawfish frogs, I know when I was in Missouri, they were definitely declining in population. And I assume in Iowa, there's a similar trend. Um, a lot of the time, um, they won't say that an organism is extirpated or has left the state until a certain amount of time has left since a sighting. I'm not sure when the last sighting of a crawfish frog was in Iowa. Um, they are uncommon, um, or they were in Missouri. Um, so that that's an interesting question. So I'd, I'd have to look that up, but they are awesome frogs. So I hope that there's some remnant populations around. Great question, Candace. Thanks so much. Hey, here's a fun one. Gina, what's your favorite amphibian and or reptile? Uh, um, I really like, let's see. I really want to find a Great Plains toad. I'm a frog person all the way. So toads, I think are just awesome. Um, and they have amazing calls and they're just super neat organisms. And I'd like to be able to find more than just American frogs. Um, and then for reptiles, I really like hognose snakes. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about them just because I had to pack so much into this uh presentation but they have little upturned noses um and they're just really interesting snakes oh fantastic hey bob sarter want to thank you he says he's found both terrapin carolina carolina and terrapin terrapin truingus eastern and three-toed okay. box turtles in scott and muscatine counties along the river bluff there so fantastic they love they love river bluffs so that makes sense. That's awesome that he found more than just uh, ornate box turtles in Iowa. They must be moving. Sandra wants to know, is there a good Illinois or central Midwest guidebook for some of these? Uh, some of these? Um, I use the Peterson guide. Um, with reptiles and amphibians though, I tend to default to the internet um, just because a lot changes over the years with how things are classified and the ranges of organisms. Um, but I'll try to find a good website for both Illinois and Iowa to post um, with that update email after the presentation. So Todd wants to know, un so unlike bird apps, uh, there are no available uh, apps for learning various frog sounds? Um, I haven't found an app for that. I have found um, there's this album that's available on Spotify that has a, a bunch of different frog calls on it. So sometimes I'll, I'll listen to that and then I'll look at my phone and figure out who I'm listening to. <laughs> <laughs> that is too cool. Oh, here's a fun one. Madison wants to know, uh, the Park Zoo would like to know where you got your shirt. Can you share? Oh, yes. Okay. I got my shirt from modcloth.com. Um, and this is one of my favorite shirts. It has just a bunch of frogs on it. Um, but I love 
having frog shirts and snake shirts and just showing everyone that I'm a crazy herpetology person. Oh, hey, great reference. Thanks, Candace. Uh, she says, Terry Vandewall's new 2022 book, The Natural History of the Snakes and Lizards of Iowa, is a great new book. So uh, maybe we'll try to include that in the follow-up email, uh, Gina. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, we are coming to the end of our hour. I think I've got through all of the questions. I want to thank everyone for, for joining us for this fantastic topic. Uh, Gina, we had over 100 people participate, so I think that's a testament to the topic and, and certainly your abilities as a speaker. So we want to thank everyone. Uh, Gina, correct me if I'm wrong, we'll have this um, posted someplace and then you'll be able to um, send out a link. And um, yeah. oh, 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 I want to mention this before folks run off here. Uh, Megan says the Iowa DNR has some downloadable frog sounds. So maybe do a quick Google search of Iowa DNR frog sounds and see what you can find and maybe we'll do a little research in the background and see if we can find it and include a link so with that everyone have a great day take care and uh hey if you get snowed in listen to some of those frog sounds <laughs>